a little closer. Okay. Is it better? How about that? It's a little better. Eight to my Yeah. I may even pull it out because I'm going to walk a little bit. Okay, but uh, I wanted you to know that the information, a lot of the very old information I'm going to talk about today, came from the Able History. And thankfully, our ancestors, and when I say our, I'm Dan's wife. I'm not an able. <laughs> but uh, when I say our and us and we, I'm referring to the ables. But thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, uh, the ancestors kept up with family history. And so this history, as old as it is, was handed down the generations and they preserved it. We had copies of that, so I had Dean make that for me. I've got a book on it. So we'll start out uh, sometime prior to the Revolutionary War. Now that time period was 1775 to 1783. Sometime prior to that, there came from Germany to America a young man named Abel, whose given name was most probably John. He was the oldest of seven brothers who came to the New World seeking a wider field in which to build his fortune and enjoy his personal, political, and religious freedom. It's believed that he settled in either Virginia or North Carolina. And we know that this John, and you're going to hear a lot of family members named John, but we know that this John and his wife, whose name was Isabel McClure Abel, had four children. Philip, John, Cain, and a daughter named Christine. The three Abel sons and their brother-in-law, whose name was Joseph Johnston, and William Bice, who was a brother of Cain's intended wife at the time, they left to seek their fortunes in the wilderness across the mountains of Tennessee. Their personal property consisted of a horse, saddle, and bridle each, and their trusty rifles and hunting knives. They set out on an exploring expedition across the mountains into a dense forest inhabited by wild beasts and wild Indians. No roads except for the treacherous Indian trails. Wild game for food and often the broad canopy of heaven, their only shelter for the night. They pressed on with the impassable Tennessee River on one side and the mountains and huge black cliffs on the other. And they halted at what we know today as Dayton, before it was known as Miss Crossroads, where they found cheap lands and other conditions to suit them. And they decided to plant their new colony here. Okay. In 1808, they each bought 100 acres of land from one Daniel Rawlings, who sold land grants back in that day. And if you ever wanted to research land grants, it's so interesting to find out about that. You've got time on your hands, go research land grants. But the consideration set out in the deeds was $100. But in reality, it was a horse, saddle, and bridle for each tract of land. They set out to retrace their steps back to their old homes on foot. Then they loaded up the families and personal goods into five ox wagons and again made the slow and dangerous journey back to Tennessee. Now John and Philip Abel never married. They remained on their farms here in Dayton until they died. And we believe that Christine and her husband later migrated across the river into the Meigs and Bradley County area, although we haven't done any further research to find out about her family descendants, it is possible, we think maybe, that the Johnstons from the Coca-Cola Company over there could be relatives, we don't know. Uh, and you'll see a picture here of the deed, back up Jacob one there. Uh, that is the original deed, it's dated 1809. We know they were here before they bought this acreage. It's dated 1809, we have the original deed, and 
uh, we have a copy of it in one of the books over here on the table if you'd like to look through that. It's a beautiful document, so fragile. And so now our family patriarch, the one we're going to talk about today, that the Dayton Abels are descended from, is Cain Abel. He was born in 1766 and died in 1850. And that's a picture of him. That is an older gentleman. And his wife, Margaret Vice Abel, and she is thought in the family history that she may be of Dutch descent. If you look at her with that bonnet on and that high collar, she kind of looks like a Dutch lady, doesn't she? The Cain Abel's tract of land uh, early on is one mile south of what was later called Smith's Crossroads. Now they, he married Margaret Bice here in Ray County and Billy's Law Cabin and Homestead and began their family of six children. Okay, the next landmark we got there, Jacob, is the log cabin. This is the original Cain Abel log cabin. And where that is today is behind Wendy's. As you go that street there uh, to the Abel Cemetery, before crossing the railroad tracks, it would be on your right there. This is that general location where Elmer Kelly's house was. Remember that? some years ago, and that property now belongs to Alan and Gail Kelly. But uh, even Felix Abel told me, he remembered the cabin being there before it was worn down. Mm -hmm. And he said it was in that general area where the um, garage apartment is, right there in that general area. And this is a picture of John R. Abel Jr. Uh, in front of the log cabin. Each of the family, as we go along, you'll see uh, when there was a family reunion, first one being in 1916, they all gathered there for dinner on the grounds, and then they had the family groups, each branch would uh, gather there and have their pictures made. And this is the John R. Abel Jr. family. And on that property, that old spring house that they would get water from when they would gather for these reunions, that old spring house is still there today. It's next to, if you drive down there on Laurel Drive, it's next to what was formerly Bart's Feed and Seed, Little Pot Pump House, uh, Laurel Drive. And years later, in 1916, uh, they would gather that water and eat outside, and even in the books over here, we've got pictures of them with food sitting on the ground and the men standing up, and, and they dressed up back then for reunions. In 1916, even in the warm weather, this one's dated in June, they wore suits. The ladies wore hats, long dresses back then. So it had to be quite warm. But back to Cain Abel, he grew up without any education. And as soon as his eldest son, Jeff, and daughter Polly became old enough, he and three or four of the neighbors built a private schoolhouse somewhere about the foot of Lone Mountain. So we could have been back in that area there behind Wendy's there that goes up to the foot of Long Mountain. And I think it's probably close to the log cabin, I would think. Um, he wanted to give his children an education so that they could help him in his business. He gave all of his children as good, as good an education as the times and opportunity afforded. And what we call a common school education. The old people, although without any education themselves, by industry, frugality, and just good old common horse sense, acquired considerable property, owning all the land from Richland Creek in Dayton for almost four miles down the valley, and it was known as Able Town. And Dan and I drove this off this weekend. And we started at the bridge there at the Dayton Walking Track there by the Welcome Center, and we went four miles down the road. And it would take you about to the area where the OKO service station was, right before you turned to go to Brazel. That would be about four miles. That was the Able property. When the old folks died, they left their children each a home in the area and a comfortable start in life. Besides farming, Cain Abel owned a stock stand, the same thing as a country tavern in the day, where travelers coming through could get lodging and feed for their stock. 
being on a public road, there was considerable travel by stockmen driving stock to southern markets and then returning. Now, it's noted in the records here that Cain Abel served on the Ray County Grand Jury in 1808 and 1815. So he began early serving his community. The older Abel family were strict, old-fashioned Presbyterians. Their library consisted of the old family Bible and the Presbyterian Confession of Faith. The Sabbath was observed as a holy day of rest and religious training. Very little cooking or any work that could be avoided was allowed on that day. Under moral conditions like this, the family was raised and departed not from their early training. They lived to a ripe old age and all went down to the grave without a spot or blemish to mar their good name. Okay, so this is, uh, I guess we can't enlarge that, but this is a breakdown of the family tree that I'm going to talk a little bit about each family member. I won't go into great detail with all the children because it is a large family. But I'll tell you some highlights on some of the family. And Margaret Abel had five sons and one daughter. We believe the Abel family to be patriotic, given the names of the four oldest boys. The first one, oldest one, was William Jefferson, who, of course, was named after Thomas Jefferson. Then there was James Jackson Abel, who was named after Andrew Jackson. And John Robertson Abel, after the great Tennessee explorer and companion of Daniel Boone, James Robertson and Robert Perry, who was named after Commodore Perry of the U.S. Navy. John Robertson Abel, this is my husband's family branch. There it is, John Robertson. And it puzzled me because so many of the court records, and as you see, census records, a lot of times they misspell names. Well, his name was always John Robertson. Well, we found this poster where he put a horse up for sale. His name's on it with a T. And that just puzzled me to no end. I said, the man would surely know how to spell his own name. I don't believe this is wrong. Well, I Googled and searched, researched the pioneer, John Robertson. And sure enough, it's spelled with a T. So I confirmed that, and not only that did I confirm, but that he, and I brought the documents here somewhere, the Tennessee Constitution. James Robertson, the pioneer uh, explorer. He was also called the father of Tennessee. And he co-founded what's now Nashville. So his name got around and one of the able children was named after him. So the story was handed down in the family that Cain's wife Margaret was a quiet, plain woman, however, with a jovial wit about her. The story goes that when a neighbor woman came visiting, she asked her, knowing that she had five children, she asked her, well, what's the names of her children? She just got up, went to the front door of the log cabin, and she called aloud, William Jefferson, tell James Jackson to tell Robert Perry, to tell John Robertson, to tell Mary Wright to bring Cain Whitehouse to the house. <laughs> so, uh, that's just how she named her children, and she just went and called them, and I guess they all looked after each other. <laughs> and then uh, there's the boys, and then the one daughter, Mary Wright Abel, and uh, she was affectionately known as Aunt Polly. We'll talk a little bit about her. The first child being William Jefferson, here on the left, the oldest, he operated. Do we have Paulette here today? There you are. I can't see you, Paulette. I do now. Paulette's here from the Decatur Historical Museum, Genealogical Museum. But the uh, first child was William Jefferson Abel, and he uh, was in the mercantile business in Decatur. He taught mathematics in 1834 in Meigs County and composed his own mathematics workbook for the students. He was known as Jeff back then. He bought a building and he sold merchandise out of that building during the Civil War. And then he later added on to that building to make it his home. And the old home 
place, and I have a picture of it, one of the books over here. The old home place over there in Decatur was today where the Meg's Community Bank is, over there in Decatur. And William Jefferson, Jeff had three children. His oldest son, John Mossable, ran a mercantile store over there until after his father passed on. And he also served as circuit court clerk of Meg's County for several years. The younger son, Dr. William Jefferson Abel Jr., was a prominent doctor in Decatur. His practice was in the store building section of that home place for 60 years. He made calls on horseback and was responsible for bringing in the first automobile to Decatur by way of the riverboat named Joe Wheeler. is 
Jane, Dr. Jane Floyd Abel's house, and he operated out of that house. When the county seat was moved from Washington to Dayton, one dark night in June of 1878, James Floyd Abel, Dr. James, not at that time, James Floyd and Boss Broyles wrecked a sign and burned it because they objected to the new railroad station being named Sapwatch. Remember that story? So I guess it was not a popular name with town residents. So that's his claim to fame. But uh, another son of James Jackson Abel was R.P. Abel. Uh, Linda, I believe he was an attorney. Am I he right? had several positions. He, had, he was an insurance salesman. He did several things. He did several things. But his wife, Annie, operated the Abel, I've heard it called the Abel School of Business or Abel Business College. And uh, it was believed it was located in their home, which was right there on Market Street. And it, it was located about today where the Robinson Manufacturing offices are. Uh, the two-story slate roof house they lived in was actually moved across the field, back in the back there, next to the R.K. Abel property, where the ball fields are today. Across from the ball fields. Across from the ball fields. That's the same street still there. Can I ask a question? Sure. I don't mean to interrupt you, but James Floyd Abel, uh, the house behind the service station, was it that where Miss Leva Yes. Cora and Leela Abel. Yes, they yeah. did. They did live there for a long time. Yep. Uh, but that house was moved there, and Miss Annie was listed as an instructor in secretarial studies in the 1936 Brian Commoner yearbook. <coughs> okay. This house will be familiar to a lot of you. This is the house that James Jackson Abel built. And he owned it. It was a prominent hotel built in 1881 during the construction of the Cincinnati Southern Railroad during the Smith's Crossroads era. Today, that house, well, not today, but after uh, this period of time, you remember the Morgan Apartments there across from Steve's Mobile there going up Delaware Avenue? This is that same house. Of course, it was later demolished to become now what is part of the Robinson Manufacturing parking lot. But this house was uh, earlier sold to the Morgan family. And they bought it. An article that we've read says that they bought the contents that was in the house at that time. Okay, this is a picture of James Jackson Abel's son's mercantile store. His name was John Abel. Different John in a different branch from the James Jackson branch family. This is the old mercantile store that he and his wife Emma owned and operated the old Dayton Hotel. I thought that went wrong. This is the mercantile store that sits where Robinson's Manufacturing Company is today. He was also engaged in the lumber and timber business. And at the time of his death, he was mayor of Dayton. Okay. And, Be in the beginning, and this building is still standing. Well, it's, it's, behind, it's behind the tin at Robinson Manufacturing. All that tin on the front, if you pull that tin off, this building is underneath. Libby Lewis actually remembers when she lived across from there, seeing the old paint on there. She remembers that before it was covered up. The, uh, now John Abel, the same mercantile merchant here, he uh, and his wife Emma owned and operated the old Dayton Hotel, which was located immediately east and across the tracks from the South Dayton Railway Depot. Those of you that know, remember we had a north and a south railroad depot? Well, it was located across from the south depot until it was destroyed by fire in 1896. And that's when he began the mercantile business. Okay, some of you remember this old Hodges house? Okay, James Jackson Abel's grandson 
was William Lee Hodges. And William Lee Hodges was the father of Igo Hodges. Both of them being prominent jewelers in Dayton. Now Igo Hodges was the father of Jane Ellen Farnsworth, you know Edwin Farnsworth, and Betty Hodges. They were the great great granddaughters of James Jackson Abel. They were not able to be with us today. They live in, uh, one lives in Dayton. They were not able to come today. But the landmark there, this Hodges house, is now on the lot occupied by Robinsons. When they expanded from the old mercantile store, they tore that beautiful house down and added up. Jane Allen and Betty had a brother, Igo. They did. Yes. They had a brother named Igo. That's exactly right. Now, another grandson of James Jackson Abel, some of you will remember, was R.K. Abel. He ran the Gulf Distribution Center in town. Uh, the landmark there today is where the, remember where the old co-op was up by the railroad tracks, up by Victory Baptist Church, up there, white building, still there, but it used to be a co-op. But that's where he had his distribution center. Another great grandson that you will remember was Lester David Abel. He was a local barber and worked at Farrell Reed's Barber Shop. And he also worked at Abel Hardware. A lot of you will remember him. Now, his family is here today. His daughter, Linda, came all the way from Alabama today, her husband. And then his uh, son, David, and his wife, Linda, sitting back there. Now, Lois. Lois not here. Lois is not here. Uh, that's Lester David's wife. And a lot of you will remember Jackie Abel, former teacher and coach at Ray Central. He's another great, great grandson of James Jackson Abel. And another one, great, great grandson, was attorney Bill McFeeders. His mother was Willie Lee Hodges McFeeders. And other family members of this branch, you'll remember Orville Ganaway, his wife Eva. Eva was an Abel. And Dunk and Grace Abel, and Emily Joe Abel, and Ken Morgan, and then their daughter Libby. Libby was our age. Let's go with her. Okay, this, and then we'll get over into the John Robertson Abel Sr. Uh, branch of the family. This is my husband's branch. This is a picture of the old home place with him in there. And this is really the only old uh, picture of him I can find as an older man. And this is his daughter standing up there. Is his daughter Martha Abel. And then Aunt Belle is the one sitting down there. Uh, this picture is dated 1895, and that's the one I have in the frame sitting over there on the little easel. Uh, he was the fourth child of Cain Abel. He was a farmer and a mail carrier between Smith's Crossroads and Bradley County. He served in the Confederate Army and was a member of Captain Waterhouse's company. Now this home place you're looking at sat today where American Pride Produce is. And a lot of you, even I am old enough to remember uh, the little white house dilapidated at the time when I was young, sitting down lower than the highway. They made that highway through there. They always raised highway up. So that house sat down, kind of like that does now, on Market Street Produce. It's down in there. And that's where they live. And these are his two daughters that never married. And they took care of him in his old age and stayed with him. Uh, he had seven children. His youngest daughter, Laura Bell, or Aunt Bell as we called her, the one sitting down there, lived to be a hundred years old. This is a picture of her in the nursing home. They gave her a big birthday party, her hundredth birthday back then, 19, I think she passed in 70. Uh, you know, that, that was a milestone to reach a hundred back then. Now it's pretty common. But uh, she continues living there at the home place in Abletown. And uh, she uh, had cows, cows and chickens. And so she uh, produced uh, butter and eggs and she sold them to the sanitary grocery.
grocery and other stores in Dayton, and that was her living. That's how she got by. And after the railroad came through, and, and you have to understand, the railroad came through a lot of able property, Cincinnati Railroad. But after the railroad came through her property, the train hit and killed two of her milk cows. Well, she wrote a letter to the railroad telling them about the incident. She received a letter back from the claims agent in Chattanooga. They told her that they'd like to avoid any litigation, and they offered her $135, which in today's money would be equivalent to $1,866.98. And so we have that letter, but we don't have proof. We don't know if she accepted the offer or not. I'd say she did. I would say that $135 was a lot of money. Century, I would say early 1900 there. But he 
fish, uh, raised those strawberries and shipped them out via freight. We have some of the freight tickets in the, the book over here, the book of artifacts. Now this John R. Jr. could uh, probably be called a land grabber if you've heard that term before. He was very well known for buying up lots and property in town, as, as the Abel family was. That's how they prospered. And uh, John R. Jr. bought a lot of city lots. And uh, his original house, uh, Jacob, well, I'll, I'll say this before we go to the next picture. John R. Jr.'s original house was behind the pilot service station. It's now called B&E. Do you remember what it used to be, pilot service station? And across the railroad tracks behind it, there was a white two-story house that burned a couple years ago. That was the original John R. Abel Jr. house. And then, this was the house that he was living in at the time of his passing. They moved that white house from this location today. This is across the tracks from Food City today. It's still there. Um, but that white house sat there and it was moved to up there behind the pilot station so that they could build a red brick house. He owned Able Hardware with his sons until his passing as well as the connecting building that housed the Shibley Five and Dime store. And he owned a number of rental houses that formerly sat where the Dayton Municipal Building is today on West First Avenue in the library. And in that newspaper spread out on the table there, you'll see some of those houses that were there before they demolished them to make room for the municipal building in the library. This is a picture of the Abel Dairy Farm, the silos, and the big barn there. Uh, I can tell you one of the men, I zoomed in on the scanner, and I know one of the men sitting on top of that silo is Dan's grandfather, Albert Abel. I can pick him out. We have other pictures of him, so I know that was him. Can't tell you how he got up there. <laughs> but we know that town. And uh, that is John R. standing down at the bottom there with a dark hat on his son Fred next to him. So all the land area where Food City is, We Care, Family Dollar, and other businesses there, that was formerly the John R. Abel Jr. Dairy Farm. Milk was sold. Dan's grandfather, Albert Hall, milk to Chattanooga. Sold it, brought it back. We got the receipts from that. And also delivered to the Dayton area. And they had uh, a contract, of course, with the home stores back then. You know, Mr. McDonald. Of course, the McDonald's are tied in with the Abel family, too. That's another path. In 1939, John R. Jr. leased four and a half acres of land to TVA, Department of Forestry Relations, for a CCC camp. You know what a CCC camp is? Civilian Conservation Corps. A lot of people don't know this, but it was located at the current uh, Robert Abel house where Dan grew up, lived there, and Robert had a cornfield there. It's the highway, Hawassi Highway, that goes to Cleveland. Right as you go up under the red light there at Napa Auto Parts, right in that field there that was cornfield. And that's where the CCC camp was. And Dan remembers the concrete slab being there because his daddy dusted it up to plant his garden. <laughs> so he remembers that. Uh, he kind of had to help. I'm sure, I'm sure you did. Well, your daddy, I'm sure you did. So that's where Hawassi Highway and the Mainly Hollow Roads are today. Uh, and uh, another site is the Dayton Housing Authority. Where that sits today, that was part of the original Able land track. And as I mentioned earlier, going on down south, Wendy's, Arby's, Lowe's, Bojangles, TVA Credit Union, all of that now occupy land that was in the original Able track, formerly known as Able Town. Highway 27 South runs through the original Able property going south. Okay, next family member, we're getting there. This is uh, the best picture I could, that we have of Robert Perry Abel, the one named after Commodore Perry. We don't know a lot about him. 
him. He was the fifth child. He was a farmer and a soldier in the Confederate Army in Captain Waterhouse's company. He was taken prisoner of war, and he died in prison in Albany, Indiana, in 1864 at the young age of 45. He's still buried there. He never was brought back here. He had seven children, and one of his daughters, Margaret Adeline Abel, pretty lady here, Miss Degara type I've got, uh, she was a private in the all-female cavalry unit, Lee Alt, whose family were dating merchants, and most of the Alts are buried up in the College Hill Cemetery. And uh, Landmark here, one of their home places, one of the Alt families, which has since been torn down, was on the street leading to the Dayton Housing Authority, which would have been a little bit below that red brick house you saw a while ago. You're going to Taylor Hills, the housing project, that Alt house sat there. And then I just found out this weekend that another Alt house uh, originally was the big white house torn down at the corner of Highway 27, and is that Florida Avenue? No, or Burl Street. Burl Street. Uh, kind of in there where Century 21 Real Estate is, right there, the intersection. It would have been on that corner right next to David and Linda Abel's house. Beautiful white house. And the Robinson family later owned it, and uh, they rented it out for apartments. But it was originally an all house. The sixth child of Cain Abel was named Cain White House Abel. The White House coming from the mother's side of the family, Margaret Bison's side. Cain White House was a farmer who owned and operated the mill. Uh, this uh, house is in, is in this 1916 reunion picture. This is where they gathered. No, I'm sorry. This one's 1919 picture. This is where they gathered in front of Cain White House's house. Now, this house sat uh, today would be behind Save a Lot and Arby's on that Laurel Drive, and it faced Lone Mountain. And the reason we know that, that's in the family history. But also, Jacob, you'll notice behind this house, see this hill? The hill line there is that big hill there behind McDonald's and where Preble Jeep was and all. So we know it faced Lone Mountain. And by the way, that hillside's called Ellis Ridge. You knew that. Uh, Kane White House Sable. You're not going to say we're getting him. <laughs> In relation, <laughs> but their property is joined according to the deeds we have. Property is joined. Kane White House was elected common school commissioner for the 24th district of Ray County at Smith's Crossroads. He had 10 children as well. Uh, and one of his daughters, Susan Catherine Abel, married into the Johnson family, hence the connection between Abel Hardware and Johnson Hardware. Most everyone thought they were competitors, but actually, they were cousins. If Abel Hardware didn't have what you wanted, they would send you over to Johnson Hardware and vice versa. I see Ralph nodding his head. You remember that, don't you, Ralph? I've heard that a long time ago. Uh, he had a daughter named Arba Zane Abel. That's two Abel girls named Arba Zane, so you could tell they were close family. But this daughter, Arvazine, married Luke Coulter. And his son, and uh, Kane White House's son, Franklin Hall Abel, married Mary Coulter. So, daughter married a colder man, and an able man married a colder woman. So, this explains why there are colder family buried in Abel Cemetery, the connection there. Three of Kane White House's grandsons migrated to Bradley County and operated an able hardware store over there. I have a picture of them in the book. But it seems that this branch of the family tended to migrate across the river for, for some reason. So we don't have a whole lot of history left on them. There's some Barnells in family, and I think the Barnells over there that have that fruit orchard and all, probably relatives somehow. This is a picture of Cain 
Meadows Tombstone. The Abel Family Cemetery is located on the road beside Wendy's Restaurant in between Kelly Motel there. Go across the railroad tracks, it's on the right. The land it's located on would have belonged to Cain Abel and would have been near his cabin. Is this the original Cain that was... Yeah. yeah and he, he was also... Uh, stationed out at Fort Garrison at one time too. That's Remember? right. Yeah. He was uh, discharged. We, we have a record of that. He didn't yeah. serve a long time. He was excused for some reason. For sickness or something. We, yeah. we don't know. Before I go a little bit further here, let me just explain. The old charcoal drawing you see here, we have no proof. Linda and I have talked about this. We have no proof that that is Cain Abel. But we, this came from Cain Abel's son's house in our family. Uh, it was in an ornate frame, glass frame, ornate, big wire on the back. It hung up prominently in a house. It's so damaged, it's got one hole on it. I took it out and put it in this so we could preserve it. We have no proof that that's Cain. I, I can't help but feel that it is. Photography came into being sometime around 1830. Andy, am I right about that? According to my research, generally sometime around 1830. And before they... This is very early. It came from France. France. Okay, so it could be before then. But uh, they would have people go around doing these charcoal drawings, and that was portraits that hung up in the homes back then. So we know... I I just feel this is before 1830, and he would have been a younger man. You notice his hair is darker here. I can't help but feel that that being hung up prominently in an able home, that could be Cain Abel. We just don't know. No one wrote names, documented things back then. They know who they were, <laughs> but we don't. So I encourage each of you to start doing that on your photographs. We're seeing things digital now. But uh, it's a treasure, it's damaged, water damaged and all, and, and we won't have it restored. It's just beautiful the way it is, whoever it is. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was land, the, the cemetery was originally land that was Cain Abel's, and, and of course that would have been near his cabin, you know, long before the railroad came through. Uh, there are many unmarked graves there, and some are marked with only a stone. This one happened to be broken, damaged, of course it's old, and uh, we had it repaired. And uh, the old family maintained this cemetery and would collect donations for its upkeep. So I found this little booklet, and the earliest entry in it is 1912, where uh, they would collect money, and they would record when they paid someone to go clean it up names in it and it's just a treasure and it goes all the way up to uh, 19, uh, actually 1984, I guess Fred kept that up, uh, 1934, it's not 1984, it's 1934. No, never sold a lot. It's been given away. There are some names in the WPA listing, BB, there are some names in there that we don't know the connection to Abel's at all. We think probably through friendship or maybe someone that worked on the farm. Um, and of course in the early days, you know, some of the slave labor and all, you know, that, that's what people did. You were in the family farm. There was nowhere else. So we, we don't know yeah, that. of Abel's grew, whenever the Abel daughters married, they would be bringing in some other family names and generations to the family. Some of those names are Johnson, Johnston, Alt, Coulter, Hodges, Faust, Engel, Underwood, Case, Hardin, Allen, 
purser, bar nail, pays, and many, many more as you go deeper into the genealogy, which we haven't. Linda and I just kind of reached a point where we said, okay, this is it. We've got the old history. But back to our ancestor, Cain Abel. I'm going to end this presentation with another story that has been told down through the generations and preserved in the Abel family history. As I mentioned in the beginning, when Cain Abel came to this area, he owned a stock stand or something as a tavern. And for the accommodation of his customers, he was compelled to keep whiskey for them. He kept at all times a barrel or two of whiskey in the house, yet he was never known to taste it himself. Strange to say, he was a good judge of whiskey. He would pour out a glass from the barrel, and he would drop a bunch of raw cotton on it. If the cotton went to the bottom of the glass, it was good whiskey. And he bought it. But if it floated on top, it was rejected. We will say, however, the family's long since abandoned that way. It tastes good whiskey. So in closing, you can see the Abel family has a strong influence in our community. They were a patriotic, service-oriented, give-back kind of family who were strongly rooted in the faith. They were good citizens and good neighbors. And as you drive around our area today, you're most likely driving over or passing by the lands owned by our Abel forefathers who came here with a vision and made it a reality for all of us. And just recently, more able land was sold on Highway 27 South that will be developed into an improvement for Dayton and surrounding areas. And before long, you'll be driving over that land as well. Thank you so much for allowing me to share the able family history.